Our mission at Confronting Domestic Violence, CDV, is to provide real-time resources to real-time victims and offer relocation services when parents have a safe place to go and not the means to get there. Every day, countless families wake up in fear, navigating a battleground in their own home, trapped in a cycle of violence. It is a known fact the most dangerous time for a victim is when the abuser knows they're leaving right up to the point of leaving. One of the biggest challenges a parent faces is fear and finances. So while we aim to help numerous families each month by fostering multi-agency collaborations, we're humbly asking you for your support too. Every little bit helps to make our mission a reality for families ready to leave their toxic, abusive environment. No parent should have to leave everything behind or result to homelessness when leaving for safety. Your contribution can make a world of difference in offering a family to feel safe at home once again. Hey, Garcia here, and thank you for tuning in to Confronting Domestic Violence. What we cover here is not intended to ignite any triggers. For what you want to conquer, you must confront. Welcome to Confronting Domestic Violence. Today, I have Regina Hiremath with me, and we're going to talk about her journey. Many of times, another person's experience can become a life-saving resource for someone else. Regina, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Man, we have a story of our own. We've talked a lot behind the scenes, so much so that now you're a part of, not so much so that now we're sharing a journey together. Absolutely. <laughs> I love the journey we're on to. <laughs> Would you like to enlighten our listeners a little bit about that? And then we'll dive into where we're heading together. Okay, so recently I became an executive board member for Confronting Domestic Violence, heading up community relations. Yes, and we met just through Google, <laughs> I think it was, or maybe Eventbrite, where was it that you found us? I was sometimes I just scroll through social media and I think it was actually on Facebook that I saw the ad for the gala and I clicked the link and it took me to Eventbrite and I scrolled down to contact to reach out to you because I wanted to discuss how I could get involved with the event. Yes. And you're the keynote speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. What turned into a, a little snowflake has turned into a full-on avalanche. <laughs> we're, yes, we're, absolutely. We're, yeah, we're really making a, a ripple effect here together. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil too much and like just start with so much excitement. But I can't control myself. October is right here. It's in our face as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. What had really brought us together was our. Our story, our sadness, our trauma, our journey of healing, our journey of forgiveness, our journey of really just learning who we have become as new individuals post such a devastating time and experience in our lives. And even though yours and mine are pretty opposite, we do share a lot of the similar effects, short-term, long-term, longer-term, <laughs> the journey and all as it relates to our thoughts and our outlooks and our responses and things of that nature. So talk a little bit about your book. My book. <laughs> I've been working on my book for about a year now, and I'm coming to the end of it, closing it out, tying all the loose ends together. But Lessons on the Way to Want Some is really about my life story, my journey. Um, I go all the way back to my childhood, sharing um, a lot of the traumatic events that happened to me, which then explains how I came into early adulthood. Uh, just really broken and I haven't experienced a lot of trauma in early adulthood, it opened the doorway to a marriage that was overshadowed by narcissistic personality disorder. That's so I- a mouthful right there. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted, it was important for me in my healing journey to 
travel all the way back to unpeel all of the layers to figure out how it got here because I feel like you can't successfully move forward in life until you figure out your why. And I'm really excited to be uh, sharing this memoir, this journey, this healing path, uh, Lessons on the Way to One Sum is really like my baby, but it was also a journey of healing for me. I'd been in therapy for years, but this was like the final piece of therapy for me to be totally healed because I feel like I can't truly help other people unless I'm being authentically healed myself. I agree to that. Absolutely. There's a thing called trauma bonding, which necessarily is not so much one person helping to heal the other. And it's very easy to do. And although it seems comforting, it is it is not so much the healthiest. And so, yes, yeah, seeking counsel, outside counsel, and those that really understand that journey that you're going through, because there is that emotional and mental almost like battlefield that that is going at it day to day. And I don't think that anybody should go through it alone. So I just want to acknowledge and give you just such big kudos on identifying that self and following through. It's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy, but for me, it was necessary. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I say for a lot of folks, it's necessary. Uh, it's just a lot of folks. We don't typically all always go and follow through whether it's lack of resources to do it or ability to get there. Sometimes uh, single moms with little ones, once that prevents nowadays with zoom, everything, maybe it's a little different, but yeah. So talk a little bit about, or share a little bit about the, the exposure, like the personal experience that, that you have had specifically under the umbrella of what you're identifying your abuse to be as narcissistic disorder. Personality disorder and the narcissistic abuse. It's interesting. I've been divorced for a little over three years now, but it wasn't until um, a couple years after I'd been divorced that I realized that I had been a victim of domestic violence. See, my experience with domestic violence started as a child when I was probably about 12 years old when I became aware of domestic violence. My, my neighbor, she was married to an abuser and they, they had a tumultuous marriage. My cousin and I would babysit for her to try to help her out and she would pay us with cookies. But she was really a sweet person. And one day he snapped. And so that was when I learned about just how far domestic violence can go. So I'd always, I grew up believing that domestic violence was the physical aspect of it. And so throughout my marriage, I was unaware of the fact that I was a domestic violence victim. For me, it was the emotional abuse and the verbal abuse, financial abuse, and imposing things that he would do, stand over me shouting or tapping me on my forehead to imply that I was stupid or pushing his finger into my arm, small things like that. So I was unaware of the fact that I was a domestic violence victim until, like I said, after my divorce and grateful. <laughs> I'm ever so grateful to, to have survived that 23 years and gotten out and now on the other side, reaching back to help other people get out. Yeah. Yeah. So that it was more like verbal, emotional, financial. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. For our listeners that maybe are not on that other side yet, that didn't realize that they were in that situation, like you're sharing it's ironic because earlier today I was a guest on a podcast and I was saying that you don't even, when you're a victim, you don't even realize that you're a being, that you're a victim. You realize that you were a victim when you realize that you were victimized. So it's almost like this like weird staggered type of like journey that you go through. And so if you can share some of the things that maybe you were feeling 
when you were a victim, but not knowing that you were a victim yet. All right. So with narcissistic abuse, there's a lot of gaslighting, conversations that go in circles. You're dealing with somebody that has a dual personality. So in the house with you, they're one way. And to the outside or to the public, they're completely opposite. So that in and of itself is very, I've described it as you're constantly feeling like someone's snatching the rug out from under you when you're trying to walk. Someone's constantly pulling, like you're just unsure of yourself and your surroundings and everything. And because the people on the outside believed him to be one way and absolutely loved and adored him, it made it very difficult for me to mentally even understand what was going on for so long. And oftentimes, and I've, I've spoken to so many people who have been victims of narcissistic abuse, you feel as if something is wrong with you because your mind cannot come to terms with what is happening to you. And like I said, everyone on the outside believes this person is wonderful and awesome. And that further victimizes you because you don't have anyone that you can go to who isn't in the palm of your abuser's hand. Mm -hmm. And it's very challenging, very difficult. And I would say that you will need professional help. That was the only way that I could, that I could snap out of it, that I could come to terms with it, that I could start to make headway in getting myself together to leave because I was, I was so broken and so very lost. Yeah. So that sounds very familiar. Very familiar. I think that's one of the universal things that we experience regardless of the type of violence or abuse that we're going through, where we're looking at ourselves, not knowing who we are, where we are full of self-doubt, almost like no matter what, it's like a blanket covering us of doubts. Just that inner critic is now talking to you in that same derogatory manner. I 100% can relate to that. And for listeners that are hearing Regina's story here, if you're feeling these things and you're not quite sure where it's coming from or what it could possibly be, take a step back and assess where you are and what your surroundings are. And if you are feeling sadder than you are feeling happy, I wish I could remember right now off the top of my head, the website that gives you almost like an evaluation helps you determine if you are in a toxic relationship or now or not. However, what I can do is suggest that you uh, refer to the power and control wheel that will definitely help you identify some areas as well if you might be feeling a certain um, way because of these specific behaviors that are identified in there. Regina, thank you for sharing a part of that emotional reality of what you were experiencing during that time and understanding that you truly acknowledged that you needed the therapy and or the counseling and you went out and received it. And then you were able to really apply what was being taught to you or you were taking the action that was being given to you and you were able to start identifying things independently, which I believe is the right type of coaching because you don't know you or your situation better than anybody but you. So when you're able to self-identify, that is how you know you're in the right place. So tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit on how that affected you once you got out of that environment and you were in that place of realizing where you were and now where you're at. So it it took a lot of hard work to get to where I am because I was so unsure of myself. And this had been going on since childhood. I had to empower myself and go to therapy, work out, journal. And this was also during COVID. It was a very, it was an isolating experience on top of being isolated. And I had no choice but to, to look at it in a positive way in that I had more time 
as the average person goes through these things and they are being pulled in 10 different directions. And that didn't happen to me because I had time to sit down and work on myself and tell myself that I'm wonderful, that I'm good, I'm empowered, I'm strong. And I was going to pull my way out of it. And I'm grateful for every every tool that I used to get to this place. Yeah. It's a lot and it takes work. It's not something that happens overnight. You're talking about a marriage that was 23 years And that is a serious conditioning of outlook in life, conditioning of understanding your relationship, your behaviors. You, it sounds like you, you knew what to expect. You knew that it was going to be a constant circle. You knew that you weren't going to get to the outcome you were hoping for. You just didn't understand what to do about it or even how to identify it for what it is. And kudos again to you because yeah, it takes a long time to retrain the brain in its long-term conditioned state. Using every tool is great, but it's the sticking to it and the consistency that will then become a natural habit, 28 days or more, right? To develop a new habit. Yeah, so I really appreciate you sharing the vulnerability that you went through and being so transparent and open with your coach that was able to help you identify these things once again for yourself. I think that's how the better decisions are made, especially when you're able to separate what covers your logic from the emotions that you're feeling, especially when you're in that adrenaline driven state. What to what you said earlier and what I always like to say, moving out is one thing, moving on and moving forward is the real journey. (laughs) That's just the beginning. It's just, (laughs) you're at the very beginning when you start down that path. Yeah, you can move a million times, but ultimately you live in your head. Right. That's where you're at. So if you don't have your mental space in order, where are you going? So share with us a bit on how really got through that, like that breakthrough, the breakthrough where you also realized that you were no longer in that space of, I I don't want to use the word trauma lightly, but a devastation where that devastation settled and you were in your new beginning. Where were you? How did you get through that like mental and emotional, physical, financial space of feeling supported? Right. I think one of the, I like to talk about this and I talk about it in my book, but one of the best exercises that I did for myself to pull myself out quickly was to sit down and recount. And I I did this in my journal. And I encourage people to do it when they feel powerless. Recount every time you pulled yourself out of a jam. Mm -hmm. What happened, how you got yourself out, all the help that showed up along the way. I found that to be a powerful exercise because it showed me every time in my life that I fought for myself. And that was it was incredible. It was really incredible. The financial piece was really difficult because throughout the marriage, I he controlled all the money and everything. And that was one of the biggest reasons I stayed because I was afraid that I couldn't manage on my own, not really having done it for very long as a young adult. And then going into the marriage and someone takes control of the money and everything. But I just kept reassuring myself that you did it as a young adult. You're capable of doing it. Things are much different now, but not really. And you can figure it out. And what you don't know, you have people around you really care about you that you can reach out to to ask for help and empower yourself. It's just the constant, the constant desire to empower yourself because whatever we fear is conquered by knowledge. That's right. That's right. And Whatever our biggest fears are conquered by knowledge. I struggled with the financial piece of being on my own. And it was just about going online and learning and talking to people and figuring things out. And the more comfortable you become with the knowledge and you, then you're empowered and then you're unstoppable. 
So it's just a step by step, taking each issue as it comes, breaking it down, learning what you need to learn, and moving on. And 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 I, and it doesn't come so easily. I remember there was, I got this big bill, and I I set up this whole system for paying my bills, and I had I had marked it. Let's say it was like the bill was due a like. Eight two, so I had the a backslash the two, but when I went to look at it, I saw it as eight twelve because of the slash wasn't long enough, and so I paid the bill late and it cost me like three four hundred dollars because I paid that bill late. I beat myself up over it, and I realized that I'd made a simple mistake, a backslash, not long enough. It wasn't the end of the world. And I got through that. I bet you those backslashes are super. (laughs) 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 So it's just, you live, you learn, you, you make an error, you correct yourself and you move on. And that's just, that's been my journey this whole four years, living, learning, moving on. I really want to hone in on something that you said that I think speaks volume for a lot of folks who have been in, who have been in the situation and potentially still there, which is that word fear. It really is fear. Every decision we make is based on emotions. How do you feel about this decision? How do you feel about this option? How do you feel about this opportunity? It's, very often it's how we feel about something that makes us determine what decision we're going to make. And it's really hard to strip that feeling and see it for what it is because nothing is 100%. It's just the best case possible. And that's what you go for. And like you said, here you are, this young lady, you were really not really out there on your own. You got into this marriage early in life, and then you really never had to deal with finances before. So it was almost like he had this power and control over you because of the finances. And then that fear was that added layer that maybe kept you there a little bit longer. Yeah. And your babies are not all grown up. You have small children still. And for you to have gone through that for so long, but found your solace and your way of being able to get it out through your writing and then taking a step back and analyzing and seeing it for what it is and then knowing that you had to make a decision. That really is the threshold that I say resides in all of us. We may not know where our threshold is or where our boundaries are, but as soon as we figure out who we're not anymore, that's when our that's when our boundaries start becoming very clear. If you're confused about who you are, certain about who you're not, and your boundaries are there. Absolutely. And something else I wanted to say too that you mentioned, which is you have your supporting um, loved ones, you have your friends, you have your people that care about you, that step in and give you knowledge and want to help. And you're absolutely right. But I also want to say that even if you don't have those loved ones or people that know you to the core around you, trust and believe that if you are sharing your story or what's happening around you and you let people know that you need some kind of help, then you'll be surprised on how many people will jump in to come to your aid and provide that help. There really is a community out there. Absolutely. There's like a sisterhood. (laughs) There really is because there are so many people who have either been through it or have someone close to them who has been through it. And just, I just know that from the moment I made the decision to leave, everything lined up for me. Everything, every step of the way. I went to put my foot down and it landed somewhere. And those little, that little pathway got me to where I am today. So I know all too well that when you say I'm ready to go, the pathway just lights up for you. You don't see it and you don't know, but trust. 
it's there. That's it's right. That's right. And faith moves mountains. And when you're putting the work in, you reap the fruits of your labor. And I, I have to say that that's what confronting domestic violence is about. When you know that you're ready to leave, listen, we're not here to convince you. We're here to help you. When you know it's time to go, then that's what we do. We help provide those services to relocate when you have a safe place to go and not the means to get there and providing those real-time resources for those real-time needs. The moment your needs change or the moment your circumstances change, the moment is the same moment as those needs change. Just a simple example, as soon as you have a need to get to the doctor and then you get there, okay, you don't need that anymore. Now you need something else. And I'm smiling and laughing because I've been there and done that. And I know it's not funny. I'm just giving an example. And it's real for everybody who's going through that. And Regina, tell people what you're doing today. You mm -hmm. talked about your experience, sorry, and the journey that you have gone through. And look at this beautiful smile on your face. <laughs> this is <laughs> where you're at today. Yeah, share away. Yes. So right after I filed for divorce, I had this idea to start a divorce blog. I knew nothing about blogs. I'm not even sure if I ever read one. But I was going to start a divorce blog. And about six months later, I launched Alimonia Life. And less than a year from then, it was just a, I don't know, a few months later that I brought on three other writers because I can't write at all. <laughs> but then shortly from there, I started a private community on a secure network. And that's been the most beautiful parts of my blog is having the private community, having a space where people can come in and share commonality and I can encourage them and talk with them and share with them through my own experiences. A couple of the ladies and I, we had a little conversation today and that just warms my heart that people feel safe in that space that, that I started out of a need for myself. And I started that community under an alias because I started early on in the process and I was still healing myself. And eventually I wrote a blog post, came out as myself. I made a decision at that point to use my face, my voice, in whatever way that I could to encourage people and so shortly after I spoke that into existence, I was asked to speak at an abuse symposium at last year. No one knew that I had lifelong fear of public speaking. <laughs> so I had to quickly get over that. And I have to say that there's something so incredibly awesome that happens when purpose, passion, and preparation come together. That's the only way that I can verbalize what happened that day. It was like having an out-of-body experience, but I'm truly grateful for it. I was asked to speak at a conference a couple of months later. Just, I'm just, I'm doing, I'm walking in my purpose, my calling and my passion. I took the next, I took the next six to eight months off because I wanted to focus on writing the book and um, really did not take another speaking engagement until summertime this year. And then, of course, when you and I spoke, of course, I had to step in to speak for the Confronting Domestic Violence Gala Fundraiser. So I'm just, I'm seeking out things that align with my purpose and passions and it just it lines up it just lines up and I'm grateful more than grateful for that yeah <laughs> yeah and this is a true definition and testimony of post-traumatic growth here you were in this place of confusion and sadness and understanding that you needed a way out but unclear on how to do that and you acknowledge that you needed help and you took all the steps to do that 
And now here you are writing about it, helping others to the point where you have private groups, you have a safe place for people to open up and be vulnerable. You're having stages to speak. To, to share your story, let your voice be heard. You're sitting on boards. You're about to be an international speaker. You're having your book signing, your book launch. There's a lot of things going on here. Let's drop some, let's drop a wounds to wisdom statement. What would be your personal wounds to wisdom statement for our listeners? My personal statement would be, if only I had known that the strength that carried me over the years, that helped me to endure those really rough times of my life would become the strength that I use daily, not only for myself, but for others, I would have left much sooner. Yeah. 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 You know what? Your mental health is the biggest price you'll pay. For sure. Do not neglect that. Yeah, I think we would have all lived sooner if we knew back then what we knew, what we know now, right? Absolutely. And and that's the it's part of the journey. That's it's all right. part of the journey. It's part of the process. And I'm now realizing that as traumatic and painful as my story has been, it is also the key that allows me to reach places and people that can relate. Yes, yes. That relatability makes a big difference. So do you have a rant or a rave about an identifiable gap that you're aware of that you'd like to take a minute to address? I'm sorry. (laughs) Can you clarify that for me? (laughs) Yes. As it relates to your journey, what you know, the people that you're talking to and that maybe ask questions that you can help them with or can't help with them with, has there been any gaps that you have identified along your journey that you would like to take a minute to rant or rave or address or put out there at all? Any gaps? Um, I think I'm still... <laughs> No problem. I'll, I'll I'll speak for what I know as it relates to like identifiable gaps. Um, I'm noticing that a lot of government funding for domestic and- violence organizations okay. are starting to decrease. And with the increase of domestic violence since COVID, and that has definitely pushed the needle quite a bit. I'm a little upset that we don't have more support for that community. Right. That's mine. <laughs> okay. And now, I think that now, and I think that both of us are doing something about it. I think we're filling that gap. I think the gap that I have found is that it's been hard to find my people. It's been hard to tap into people who are in need of support for divorce or who've been through narcissistic abuse. And I I think that's mainly because they isolate. They are isolated and then they continue to isolate themselves. And I get it because I've been there. So it's been hard for me to try to tap into that, into that community. Okay. So what you're identifying as my people are the people that have or are enduring some of your similar experiences that you're looking to build a community with to either help on the healing journey or give some, share some information or knowledge or guidance. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think that your book is definitely going to be a huge component to that. I think that the speaking engagements that you're lined up to do and that you're continuously pursuing, <clears throat> because I recall asking you not too long ago, what is your like long-term goal? And you said you wanted to be a, a paid speaker and you're well on your way. So you're going to find your people. You're going to get your market. You're going to get your target audience and you're going to have a bigger community than you can even imagine because I know your passion I know your commitment and we all are hearing your purpose loud and clear. (laughs) So 
So let's keep building the community together. And I'm so excited that we're on this long journey together, to be honest with you. Sometimes you just know when you run into people or meet people, you just know there's like an immediate connection or see where it goes. And I think we connected immediately. <laughs> we did. We did. And we've been connected ever since, which is just awesome. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I feel the same way. So tell people where they can find you. Let's talk about some dates of these events that we keep talking about. Your audio, or excuse me, your ebook already launched. So I'll put, I'll have the link available for people to check out your ebook. When is your actual book launching? When is your book signing happening? Where can people find you? Okay, so the book is launching on Monday, November 4th. But it will be available at my book signing on Sunday, November 3rd. That'll be the book launch party. I'll be there reading from the book and we'll have copies available for me to sign. And I'm looking forward to that because I, I love connecting with people. I just, I do. I can, I can write, I can speak and all that's great, but I really love connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so the book launch party will give me the opportunity to do that. And then just the week before, of course, we've got the Confronting Domestic Violence, Gala Fundraiser, be the keynote speaker for that. And I'm working on that speech. And I'm just going to share a tidbit of the part of the speech that I'm working on. Uh, one of my dear friends, her mother was never strong enough to leave and uh, fell ill and um, never, she never left her abusive situation. So I've included her mother in my speech. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And the title of her speech is Shattered Without a Mark. So are you gonna are you gonna have a book or two on the 27th available? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I'm working really hard. I'm pushing really hard to to wrap this thing up. And that that would really make me happy to be able to do that. I'm hoping. Okay. So for all the listeners. You'll have to come to find out. <laughs> You'll have to yes. be there and show face to find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So all these links will be available. And so confrontingdomesticviolence.org is the website that you'll find the event, that you'll find Regina. Her book is under the resource tab, or excuse me, the library tab. You'll see her under the keynote speaker tab. Her face, her links, everything is out there for her for, her, for you to find. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here on the show, for being here in this journey together, for being here and serving this community of survivors that are, are ready to heal. Yes, absolutely. I want to thank you, A. Garcia, for um, your unwavering commitment to confronting domestic violence, for being such a great and strong leader for those of us who have joined the mission. Um, I feel like I'm learning so much from you in the short time that I've been working with you guys, but I look forward to all of the wonderful things that we're going to do and how we're going to help people and change lives. <laughs> yes. From your mouth to his ears. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for that. I really appreciate it. We have a lot of work to do. So let's roll up these sleeves. Yep. Let's get to going. <laughs> All right, y'all. <laughs> we'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Our mission at Confronting Domestic Violence, CDV, is to provide real-time resources to real-time victims and offer relocation services when parents have a safe place to go and not the means to get there. Every day, countless families wake up in fear, navigating a battleground in their own home, trapped in a cycle of violence. It is a known fact the most dangerous time for a victim is when the abuser knows they're leaving 
right up to the point of leaving. One of the biggest challenges a parent faces is fear and finances. So while we aim to help numerous families each month by fostering multi-agency collaborations, we're humbly asking you for your support too. Every little bit helps to make our mission a reality for families ready to leave their toxic, abusive environment. No parent should have to leave everything behind or result to homelessness when leaving for safety. Your contribution can make a world of difference in offering a family to feel safe at home once again.